University of Pittsburgh, um, hopefully soon to be transferred to BU, my fingers are crossed, um, and Ethan Heilman, who's also my co-founder at Commonwealth Crypto, and my student at BU. Um, and so we did this research while we were at BU, kind of slowly over the last uh, two, two and a half years at a very low rate, and um, we just uh, started talking about it publicly about two weeks ago, so I'm very excited this is the first time I'm talking about this in public, apart from in a small classroom a couple weeks ago. Um, so what I want to talk about today is peer-to-peer -peer networks. So there's a lot of excitement about blockchain, um, and there's lots and lots of layers about in the blockchain, and one of the layers that we have in a blockchain is a peer-to-peer -peer network. And most people don't really care too much about this layer. Most people are very concerned about the consensus layer or the scripting layer or the decentralized apps or what you can build on top of the blockchain. What we were interested in was looking at what's underneath the blockchain at the very lowest light layer. So why should you care about peer-to-peer -peer networks? Well, think about the blockchain. The blockchain is how we have all of these systems working. Um, if you have a bunch of nodes that are all communicating, they all have to agree on what the blockchain is, right? And so if I took this room and cut it in half, and I told half of the room to only talk to each other and the other half to only talk to each other, how could the two sides of the room come to agreement on what the blockchain is if they can't communicate? Okay, and that's what we're focused on in this, in this talk. Sort of when we think about blockchains, there's an underlying assumption that everybody can kind of see the same thing, that they can all communicate. Um, but to actually see how these nodes see the same information and see the same blockchain, you have to look at the network that they use to interconnect to each other and share information, and that's the peer-to-peer -peer network. And so um, with Ethan, we've had two papers on this. We had one on Bitcoin in 2005 with Alison Kendler and Aviv Zohar. And then um, today I'm going to talk about the work on Ethereum with Yuval Marcus. So what's an eclipse attack? An eclipse attack is an attack where you get gain full control of a node's access to information. That means you control everything that it sees. Not most of what it sees, but all of what it sees. Um, and the main result that I want to talk about today is an eclipse attack on Ethereum geth clients. Um, this attack just required two remote machines, so it's a script kitty attack. Um, you didn't need a privileged uh, position on the network, you just needed a couple of machines and decide who your victim was and attack that node. Um, this was patched um, on February 14th when Geth 1.8 was released. Um, and so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the peer-to-peer -peer network, why you should care, what the attack was, how it was patched, and some lessons um, on how to design peer-to-peer -peer networks. And so one thing I hope comes out of this talk and this work is more attention paid to these part of the networks. We have new altcoins popping up all the time. I have a couple of lessons that we've learned, Ethan and I and our co-authors, uh, through the years of working on this stuff. I hope people pay attention and make sure that their blockchain also has a robust peer-to-peer -peer network. Okay, so. Um, What's a peer-to-peer -peer network? Generally speaking, in all the networks that we've looked at, which is Bitcoin and Ethereum, we have our node, and he needs to make connections. There are connections that are outgoing. These are typically TCP connections. And there are connections that are incoming. My animation's broken, doesn't matter. So outgoing connections are connections that the node itself initiates to the outside world, and incoming connections are unsolicited connections made by other nodes to our node. Okay, so there are those two kinds of connections, and these two kinds of connections are what we use to share information on the blockchain. So, um, you know, a block goes from here, goes to some neighbors, and starts propagating through the whole blockchain this way. So the directionality of the connection doesn't matter for any of the higher layer consensus stuff, but for our peer-to-peer -peer network study, we're going to have to care about whether our node initiated the connection or whether our node was connected to. Okay, because if our node initiated the connection and we want to manipulate the way it makes that connection, it's going to be a lot harder than just connecting to it, which we can just do if we want to as an attacker. So what's an eclipse attack? Um, when we do eclipse attacks on the peer-to-peer -peer network, what we have to do is completely surround our victim. So every one of the connections to that victim is actually made to the attacker instead of to a legitimate node. Okay? And so for this to be an eclipse attack, every single one of the connections needs to be to the victim, if even uh, to the attacker. If even one connection is made to a legitimate node, then we have not eclipsed the victim. Why is that? Well, the legitimate node knows the legitimate blockchain and will feed the legitimate blockchain to our victim. And our victim will see that the legitimate blockchain is probably longer and won't fall for whatever attack we're trying to do on it. Okay? So to completely eclipse the node, to eclipse the node, we need to completely surround it. Um, and so what that looks like conceptually is that our node is sitting here, the purple guy, and the attacker is sitting between him and the rest of the network. Okay, so that's what an eclipse attack is doing. Um, so just very quickly, um, there's been a bunch of work on what eclipse attacks can do to consensus algorithms and to blockchains. I want to just give you the flavor of what, uh, what can happen. These are not very sophisticated implications. They're just simple ones that you can understand why you should care. So the first one is um, a 51% attack with less than 51% of the mining power. So what we have here is we have our victim 
who is running a miner. Um, we have our attacker that's got a bunch of miners, and we got the rest of the network that has a bunch of miners. And what's happening is that um, if the attacker has 40% of the mining power and has managed to partition the network into two parts, what would happen is that um, we would have the chain that's grown by the purple uh, guy, which would be shorter than the one grown by the attacker because the attacker has more mining power. And then the chain that would be grown by the other guy would also be shorter than the one grown by the attacker because he has less mining power. And so these other chains would not be preferred. We would prefer the longest chain or the heaviest chain for whatever, you pick your consensus algorithm. But our attacker will be able to build the chain faster than the, than the nodes that he's isolated. So these tricks of network partition allow you to amplify the effect of your mining attacks. Okay, so that's one, that's one piece. Another piece is, um, I'll show you a three confirmation double spend attack. So another thing that we really worry about in blockchains are that um, someone doesn't double spend a coin. So in a double spend attack, I'll uh, give one coin to Ethan and, one co and the same coin to Yuval. And both Ethan and Yuval think they have my coin, but actually um, there's only one coin to give. Right, so maybe only really Ethan got the coin, but Yuval gave me a cup of coffee in exchange for that coin, which I should never have received. So that's a double spend attack. Let's see how to use a um, let's see how to use an eclipse attack to do that. So this one will will have 30% of the mining power on one side of the eclipse and 70% on the other. So what our attacker will do, he'll give uh, he'll tell he'll tell Bob, which is our our merchant over here, he'll tell him, Bob, I'm giving you this coin, and Bob is like, oh great, one Bitcoin. Um, that is worth a car. So here you go, here's your car. And so, um, you know, the, the adversary's received a car from Bob. Um, he's willing to send the car over because we've had three confirmations after um, this, uh, this coin was, was sent. Uh, meanwhile, um, he's also, on the other side of the partition, telling the rest of the network that this coin that he supposedly gave to Bob, he actually gave it back to himself. Okay, so he'd send a double spend of the transaction back to himself. And what happens is that the other side of the network has more mining power, and so um, that chain will be longer, and the chain that, that is seen by the miner on this side and by seen by Bob will actually get disused, and so um, the attacker has managed to get a car without actually paying Bob for the car. Okay, so we can use these types of partitions to exploit how much mining power we do or don't have in order to double spend or attack consensus. And if you want to see like a more thorough analysis of this, there's been a whole bunch of papers on, on this. Um, uh, that you can see here, and actually some of the authors are here at this, uh, at this conference. Okay, so now, let's, so now we know why um, we care about eclipse attacks. Let's talk about how we actually do them. Um, and so, uh, really interesting and fun thing, um, I'm using the stats on the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network from the paper we wrote in 2015. Okay, so some of these may have changed. But in 2015, when we studied the, um, the security of the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network, um, it had 25 total, uh, 125 total connections, of which eight were outgoing. The outgoing connections are the ones initiated by our node. Those are harder to control because the victim is making them, right? So we have to somehow trick the victim into connecting to us, even though he's deciding who he's connecting to for these eight people. Ethereum, by comparison, has fewer connections total, but more outgoing connections, right? So that looks better for Ethereum. There's more connections that the, that the, that the node decides for himself, 13 versus eight. Um, the, the most enormous difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum is that Bitcoin peer-to-peer uh, -peer network is supposed to look like a random graph. So basically think about yourself sitting in this room. You're going um, you know, to pick eight random people from this room to connect to. That's the structure of the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network oversimplified. Um, the Ethereum peer-to-peer -peer network is based on a distributed hash table protocol called Kademlia. I'm not going to have a lot of time to talk about Kademlia, but what the goal of Kademlia is, is to allow you to easily find content. So, for instance, if I'm hosting a piece of content that everybody in the room wants, there should be a protocol for you to ask only the subset of the people in, in the room that you know, how do you get to this piece of content? Who should I ask next to find the piece of content? And the number of people you should ask should be small. Okay, so you shouldn't have to ask everyone in the room. You should ask maybe a logarithmic number of people in the room. And that's what the Kademlia protocol does. So there's a lot of structure there to allow you be, to be able to identify um, where content might be. So these are the really big differences between Ethereum and Bitcoin. Another really big difference, um, in a peer-to-peer -peer network, you need identifiers. You need some way to identify the node. So we use our names as our identifiers. In the peer-to-peer, -peer, like my name is Sharon Goldberg, that could be my identifier. If I was a node in the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network, my identifier would just be my IP address. 
If I was a node in the Ethereum peer-to-peer -peer network, my node ID would be my ECDSA key. Okay? So I can choose my own node ID by choosing an ECDSA key. Um, because Ethereum has ECDSA keys as node identifiers, the connections between nodes in the Ethereum network are encrypted. Um, in the Bitcoin network, not. Um, and so this last thing gave rise to attacks by Apostolaki et al. that involved manipulating the routing protocol to attack um, Bitcoin. Um, and this all comes from the fact that the connections are not authenticated. We don't have this issue with, with Ethereum. Um, in our 2015 paper, we, uh, we managed to do attacks on Bitcoin's networks, but our attack model was that the attacker owns a botnet or the attacker is an ISP with a lot of IP addresses. Why do they need a botnet or why do they need uh, an ISP? Because nodes are identified by their IP addresses and we need a whole bunch of IP addresses in order to actually do this attack and we needed thousands of IP addresses. So today, if you want to attack the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network using this type of attack, you need thousands of IPs. Um, the attack I'm going to show you uh, today um, that was possible on Ethereum up until a couple of weeks ago, um, we needed only two IP addresses or two machines. Actually, we probably could have done it with one machine, but we just didn't bother, so we did it with two. Um, so we only re really needed two machines, and so this was a much more powerful attack because it, it doesn't require resources. You can just like stand up a machine and do this attack. So it's more of a script kitty attack than a sophisticated like botnet attack than what we had in 2015. Okay, so that's the setup. Um, how do we do an eclipse attack? So let's, I'll show you the generic pattern that was in both papers that we've, um, that we've written on this topic. Um, the first step is to um, tell the node, the, so in the peer-to-peer -peer network when you need to make connections, you have to know who's in the network. So you have some databases called the peer table that record who you've interacted with in the peer-to-peer -peer network over time. Okay, so those are called the peer-to-peer, those are called the peer tables. So the first step of our attack is to fill the victim's uh, peer tables with attacker node IDs. Okay, how do we do that? I'm going to show you later. But we need some way of filling those tables with our attacker information, not the legitimate information. So instead of having the information of everyone who's actually in the room, you're just going to have information about all my attacker nodes that are sitting there um, over there attacking everyone. Okay, so that's the first step. The second step is that the node will reboot and lose its out at current outgoing connections. So we need to disconnect these connections. The way we did that in our attacks was through a reboot. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Now that it doesn't have any outgoing connections, it's going to restart. Because we've filled its, attacker ta its table full of attacker IDs, he only knows about attackers. When he restarts, he's going to pull nodes from his peer table to connect to. Those are going to be attacker IDs owned by us. So he's going to connect to us. And then uh, finally, we will connect to him incoming. We'll just start sending incoming connections to him so nobody else can start, nobody legitimate can connect to him, and so we've also owned the incoming connections as well as the outgoing connections. So that's the general pattern for the Eclipse attacks that I've done with Ethan and our co-authors over the years. Um, I want to quickly talk about restarts. So how do restarts happen? Um, I think that there's a, just, uh, I have a sort of a story here about how restarts can happen in different settings. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. All I want to say is, if you've ever seen a crash vulnerability in a blockchain daemon, right, that, for me, the first thing I think is cool, I could use that in my Eclipse attack. Okay, so if there's ever a crash vulnerability where you can send a blockchain node, a packet that causes it to crash or restart, that is a deliberate way to control when a node starts or doesn't start. So every time you have those, those could potentially lead to an Eclipse attack. And we do have um, records of those types of CVEs in Bitcoin and Ethereum. So, and they, they come up over time. So sometimes people think crash vulnerabilities are not a big deal, but actually those are building blocks for other attacks. And one of the attacks you can build out of a crash vulnerability is an Eclipse attack. Okay, so that's how the restart happens. So we need, we need the restart in some way. There are other like non-crash attacks that you can use for restarts, but anyway. I don't want to spend too much time on that because I don't have too much time. Okay, but we do need the restarts in our attack. Um, and that's the bottom line, right? We shouldn't assume that these nodes are always online. If that's our security assumption, that's not a very secure network. Okay, so um, great. So I've told you about restarts. Now I have to tell you how to fill in the nodes uh, tables with attacker IDs. And this is really the crux of the, all of these types of attacks. How do we convince the node that only all the network that he knows about is actually the attacker rather than the, the real network that's really there? So how do we do that? So it turns out that in a peer-to-peer -peer network, as we said, there are incoming connections and outgoing connections. Whenever someone makes an incoming connection to me, I've learned about that node. So if someone comes up to me and talks to me, I've learned that that person exists in the network. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that node ID into my peer tables. Okay? So how can an attacker 
uh, write to the peer tables. He just has to make connections to his victim. Okay? And then the node ID will be written to the peer tables. So let's see how this works. Um, so our attacker comes online. He connects to our victim, the purple node. Um, and so that node ID of the attacker will get mapped to this table, which in the Ethereum network is called the buckets or the bucket table. And this is something that for those who follow like Kademlia and DHT research, this is the Kademlia buckets um, that, that, that are here. So the node ID is getting mapped to a bucket. And I'm going to tell you exactly how that works in the next slide. And also, there's a mechanism for, which I've oversimplified horrifically in this slide, okay, so it doesn't exactly work like this, um, is that the, the, um, the node can say, also, here are some other IPs I know about, here you go. And you can send those IPs, and those would also get mapped to these buckets. Um, and similarly, once they get mapped to the buckets, they also get placed in the database. And the database is a long-term storage, okay? So what happens is when a node reboots, what it does is it takes... Uh, node IDs from its uh, database and moves it into its bucket table. The bucket table is initially empty. Okay, so the database is the long-term storage of what it knows, and the bucket table is the nodes that it's currently using in order to make its connections. Okay, so the outgoing connections come out of here, um, but the database is a persistent storage. When we reboot, the bucket table is empty. Okay, so that's the structure of how we add nodes to the network, and that's the relationship between the persistent storage and the short-term storage. The next thing I want to tell you is how do we actually um, get, okay, how do we actually decide what node ID goes into what bucket? Okay, this is the crux of our attack. So, a node ID, remember in Ethereum, a node ID is an ECDSA key, okay? So it's a cryptographic key. How do I generate a node ID? I run an ECDSA key generation algorithm, which anyone can do, just take a piece of code, run it. How many ECDSA keys can I generate? Lots. I can generate as many as I want. Right, so let's keep it in mind. If I want to have like 3,000 ECDSA keys, it will take me like very, very little, I don't know, like under a second to get all those node IDs. Okay, so I can very quickly generate node IDs. So how do I, how do I know what bucket a particular node ID will end up in? Well, I've got two node IDs here. One of them is of the node. This is our victim, okay? So this is his node ID. Does the attacker know the victim's node ID? Yes because he has to establish a connection, an encrypted connection with that node, and there's gonna be a handshake protocol during which the node ID will be revealed. Okay, so our victim's node ID is public, we know it. There it is, it's in purple. And here's the new node ID that we wanna to add to the table, there it is in green. How do we decide what bucket this goes in? We take the node ID, we hash it, we get a bit string. We take the other node ID, we hash it, we get a bit string. And then we see how many bits do they have in common at the beginning? So we can see the first four bits are in common here. That means their distance is four. That means that this node goes in bucket four. Okay? So that's how you decide what bucket a particular node ID is gonna go into. So you can see with this technique, how many node IDs are gonna map to the first bucket? What fraction of node IDs are gonna map to the first bucket? Half, half. Half of the node IDs are going to map to the first bucket because half of them, are, if, if we imagine that a node ID is selected at random, the probability that it ends up in the first bucket, the probability of the first bit of that hash is the same, is going to be a half. Um, the second bucket, what's the probability that a randomly chosen node ID ends up in the second bucket? Quarter. Quarter, right? So the probability that the first two bits are the same, uh, one half times one half quarter. I also teach probability, by the way. Um, so, <laughs> so, Anyway, this is how we map node IDs. So this is the vulnerability, okay? What is the vulnerability here? The hash is public, okay? So this hash is just a hash function. It's a hash function that everybody knows. The node ID is also public because it's your node ID. So anyone can know exactly what bucket a particular node ID is gonna land in, okay? So we can actually mine node IDs to make sure they land in the buckets that we want, right? So if I wanna make sure that, um, you know, I land in bucket number uh, you know, this one, where the probability is 1 over 2 to the power of 5, right? So, okay, let me say that again. So the probability that if a randomly chosen uh, node ID lands in the ith bucket is 2 to the power of minus i. Okay, so this probability is pretty small. But if I'm an attacker and I really want to make sure that my node ID lands in bucket i, I'll just keep choosing node IDs until I find one that lands in bucket i, and then I found one. Great. I use that one and I send that to the victim and I make sure that it lands in bucket I, okay? So for the first bucket, most legitimate nodes, about half of them will land in the first bucket, a quarter of them in the second, 
um, one eighth of them in the third, and so on. But my attacker ones, I can plant, I can mine node IDs, so I make sure that I plant in every single one. Okay, so that's the vulnerability. We can mine the node IDs to make sure that we plant them where we want. The adversary will select its node IDs to occupy the buckets more aggressively than the legitimate nodes. Um, and this is the other big vulnerability that we found that was fixed. Um, all node IDs in the bucket could have the same IP address. Okay, so basically I can mine all these node IDs and then run them out of the same machine. The node, the Ethereum nodes were not checking that node IDs were actually hosted in different places on the network. Okay, so that creates a very nice script kitty attack for me. I take my machine, I mine a bunch of node IDs and I start attacking you with those node IDs, okay? So, if you're designing a peer-to-peer -peer network, please make sure you require diversity of IP addresses in your peer tables, otherwise you get stuff like this. This is not good. Um, this is fixed, by the way. So, how do we do our attacks? First step, we mine node IDs, so we make sure we have enough node IDs to fill all the buckets of the victim. We reboot our victim. Then, we need to insert attacker IDs into the victim's buckets, so we have our mined IDs. We start connecting to the victim so that our node IDs get into the buckets. Um, and then, the cool thing, there's an additional vulnerability here. Um, okay, so, right, so we make connections, we put them into the buckets, and then um, the node has his buckets full of our attacker IDs. He's gonna pick from his buckets randomly some nodes to connect to. Those are all gonna be our nodes, and so he's gonna connect to us. And um, there's also a nice additional vulnerability that we exploited, which was the fact that um, the peer-to-peer -peer network code actually wasn't starting, wasn't activating for a while. So that when a node rebooted, it kind of sat there and initialized all kinds of things, but it didn't initialize the peer-to-peer -peer network code. So there was this window where we could be connecting to the node and he would be putting us into the buckets, but he hadn't actually started his process of like learning about the network, making queries, seeding his buckets from the database and so on. Right, we had that database that had all that information about the network that should end up in the buckets. We just, um, we just preempted that, stuck all our node IDs in there before there was a chance to do any of that. At that point, we owned all the buckets, and he connects to us. So there was this additional vulnerability that upon reboot, the bucket table was empty. The whole seeding process for the bucket table didn't happen if there was at least one node in the bucket table when seeding was supposed to start, so we disabled seeding as well. Okay, this is also fixed. Um, and so finally, uh, the last thing we have to do is monopolize all the incoming connections, so make sure that all the connections that are made incoming to the node are from us, and no legitimate nodes connect to our victim, thus feeding him real information, which is not what we want to prevent. So that's our attack. So countermeasures that uh, we suggested and, and the status. So first of all, the hash is public and so is the victim's node ID. I don't have time to talk about this in great detail, or I chose not to in this talk. Perhaps there's a different version of this talk I could give about this, but um, we wanted uh, the fact that the hash, the mapping from a node ID to a bucket to stop being public, and so we suggested making the hash not public by salting it, putting a unique salt for each particular node into the hash so that the attacker wouldn't know what the hash does. Um, this unfortunately was not adopted. The reason was that the structure, the fact that you know that the hashing, the fact that this hashing is public, is used in the Kademlia protocol, and this is what gives you uh, logarithmic looks-ups in the Kademlia protocol, so they decided not to implement this countermeasure. So this is still um, in Ethereum. Um, however, it's no longer the case that you can just have a single IP with all the node IDs that you've crafted. Um, we wanted to have a one-to-one -one mapping between node IDs and IPs. Um, what happened in Geth 1.8 is that there's at most 10 uh, node IDs in the bucket table that can have the same IP. Okay, so you can host 10 Sybils behind a given IP, but no more than that. Um, and finally, this vulnerability that we exploited actually pretty aggressively, which was the fact that the peering code didn't actually do anything for a while, during which we were already attacking the node and putting stuff in its table, uh, that's, no longer, uh, that's no longer possible. Um, they made seeding a lot more aggressive, so more information from the database is moved into the table before connections are made. Also, no connections are incoming are accepted until data is moved from the database to the table. So it's a lot harder to just kind of like have the node turn on and aggressively hit it with attacker IDs. So these are the two, these are the two major sort of, there's a lot more details on how these were implemented, but these were the two major countermeasures. Um, the seeding was more aggressive. There's no gap in be between when seeding starts and, and when connections are made and um, the fact that you can no longer have all your node IDs come from the same IP, which you could before. Okay, so stepping back for people who are thinking about their own blockchain or whatever they're thinking about, um, a couple of lessons that we've learned. 
Node IDs, ideally, should be very hard to obtain. If your node ID is an ECDSA key, it's very easy to obtain. You run an EC key, key, D, ECDSA key generation algorithm, you have a new ECDSA key. That's too easy. We'd rather it be an IP address, because IP addresses are really hard to get. If you go to a cloud provider and you ask for like 1,000 IPs, most likely they're going to say no. Right? So it's very hard to get a lot of IPs, unless you have a botnet. So that raises the bar for the attacker. Um, if it's not IPs, the people need to think about what is the resource that makes it hard for people to get a lot of node IDs. For, for us, you know, we've thought about IPs, maybe there are other things that other people can think of. Um, outgoing connections should be selected in an unpredictable way. This actually is true for Ethereum. In Bitcoin prior to 2015, when we disclosed our uh, attacks to them, um, Bitcoin was selecting peers on the basis of who it heard from most recently. Okay, so how do we attack that? We make sure that the victim hears from us most recently. Right? So you don't want that. You want it to be not, not predictable. You want it to be completely random which peers you connect to. Um, and that's actually been fixed in Bitcoin. Um, the mapping from the node IDs to the peer tables should be unpredictable. We are all, all saw in this talk why that's an issue. And finally, you never want to accept incoming connections um, before you've finished making outgoing connections. Because incoming connections are how people write to your tables. You should not be allowing people to write to your tables before you've already made some connections to the outside world and learned something from the outside world. Okay, so that's it. And I think I have like one minute left. So questions, thank you. So I have a question. So uh, there were 256 buckets, right? So. I don't think like you, you could still get IPs, 256 IPs, oh, yeah, uh, no. non-trivially, so I don't think that's a good solution. Okay, so 256 buckets, actually that was another thing that they changed. So what's the probability that something lands in bucket 256? One over two to the power of 256. It's like probability of never gonna happen. Okay, so these buckets will never ever be full, right? So actually, what, one thing that they did was they minimized the number of buckets. When we studied this, there were actually 256 buckets for a 256-bit hash. The probability of this was filled to zero. Like, you'd never find anything for this, right? So I agree with you that, like, all these buckets are unnecessary, and also Ethereum agrees with you, and they also change this. Um, in terms of the restriction on the number of IPs per, ta uh, per table, so what happened was, for whatever's in the buckets, the, the, ta the bucket table ensures that no more than 10 things have the same IP address. Okay, so that essentially means that a given IP can have 10 attacker nodes behind it at most. Okay, so one IP maps to 10 attacker nodes. We wanted it to be one IP maps to one attacker node, but they wanted one to 10 because they were thinking about NATs and people sharing IP addresses and stuff like that. Okay, so it's, it's definitely better than, than what was before, which was that there was no restriction.